Safety is an integral part of our culture at Cleveland Construction. We feel that a strong safety program is a major factor in our success, and it contributes to our competitive edge by reducing our cost of doing business. Actually, safety pays well for everyone involved. The company benefits from an effective safety program resulting in a more competitive cost of doing business, and our employees are spared the agony of personal injury, the disruption of routine family life, and possibly reduced income for you and your family. So as we work together to create buildings, we must also work together to create a safe environment to do our work. We summarize this employer-employee relationship by saying that Cleveland Construction is team safety. As a member of team safety, you have an obligation to your family, your fellow workers, and your employer to work in a safe and efficient manner. To accomplish this, we believe that it is extremely important to train each worker to examine your environments and become able to identify hazards so that management can either eliminate the hazard or ensure that you're protected from the harsh effects of the hazard. An accident is the occurrence of an unexpected event. Consequently, if we take the time to identify potential hazards and neutralize them, there will be no unexpected events. Cleveland Construction has developed a program we call Job Hazard Analysis. We begin each day by examining the workplace conditions and the tasks to be performed to identify potential hazards so that we can plan to control or eliminate them before work begins. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, the agency that regulates workplace safety, states that the job hazard analysis is a technique that focuses on job tasks as a way to identify hazards before they occur. It focuses on the relationship between the worker, the task, the tools, and the work environment. Ideally, after you identify uncontrolled hazards, you will take steps to eliminate or reduce them to an acceptable risk level. So it should be clear that safety is the number one priority of Cleveland Construction's employees on and off the job site. All of our job site managers are certified competent persons. OSHA defines a competent person as one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings or working conditions which are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees, and who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. Because our managers are certified as competent persons, you can be sure that they are skilled at directing the work on our job sites with a trained eye for the hazards associated with that work. Your responsibility while working on our job site is to participate in the job hazard analysis meetings. The job site managers or competent persons of this job site has developed this work plan each day to identify hazards you will encounter. Because a construction site is continuously changing, Everyone involved with the work being performed should contribute to helping identify potential hazards to make the JHAs as productive as possible. Please pay full attention to this video so you fully understand what is expected from you as you perform your work. If anything in this video is unclear or confusing, talk with your supervisor prior to going to work. This video should be viewed as a training program to prepare you to perform routine tasks on our construction site in a safe manner. If you have any questions or concerns after viewing this video, please bring them to the attention of the competent person in charge. Lesson number one, personal protective equipment. Anyone working on a construction site should be aware that it is a very dangerous occupation and you must prepare to defend yourself every moment of the day. To best defend yourself, you will need several pieces of equipment developed for the construction worker. Cleveland Construction requires you to wear certain equipment all day because threatening events are frequent and very random. Other equipment will be required on an as-needed basis. When you have completed this training section, you will understand the required and optional personal protective equipment how to use and care for selected personal protective equipment, how to properly inspect your personal protective equipment. The following personal protective equipment is the minimum requirements to enter a Cleveland construction job site. 
Hard Hat Cleveland Construction will issue a hard hat to you before you begin work. The hard hat is to be worn at all times on the job site. Make sure you properly inspect for any cracks or damage before you begin work each day. You may have to adjust the headband for a good snug fit. The hard hat is to be worn with the largest part of the brim in the front and over your eyes. Safety Glasses On a construction site, there is always debris being propelled into the air by job site tools and activity. Safety glasses must be worn by all field personnel at all times, regardless of work activity. Standard safety glasses will be issued to all employees. However, if you purchase your own equipment, it must be approved for the intended task by your supervisor. There are various types of lenses intended for different work elements. Clear lenses are used for most work situations. Amber lenses are very useful in lower light work areas, and gray tinted sunglass style lenses are used for outdoor work in direct light. We will also provide safety glasses to be worn over prescription eyeglasses. Lens cleaning towelettes are available to keep safety glasses clear and reduce scratches. Proper clothing. All workers are required to be properly clothed for a Cleveland construction job site, which includes a shirt with at least a four inch sleeve, long pants, and hard soled shoes. A six inch high work boot is recommended because it helps to prevent ankle twists and sprains. Employees are also required to wear a safety vest or high visibility shirts or outerwear. Some tasks may also require long sleeves and or steel-toed shoes. Cut off shirts, tank tops, muscle shirts or tennis shoes are not permitted along with loose clothing, baggy shirts, ripped, tattered or dragging work pants. Other task specific personal protective equipment you may need include hearing protection, respiratory protection, hand protection, face shields, and safety harness. Hearing protection. It is mandatory to wear hearing protection when you are near any such tools, equipment, or machinery that emit loud or shrill noises. Earplugs or earmuffs must be worn when using powder actuated or gas powered tools. Standard construction site rules state that if you are within two feet of someone and you need to shout to communicate, hearing protection is probably needed. Remember, if your ears are damaged by loud noises, they cannot be fully restored to their original efficiency. Respiratory protection. Although respiratory protection is not required by Cleveland Construction for the customary work we perform, we have established a voluntary respirator use policy. We will supply an N95 dust mask to any employee looking for an additional level of comfort and protection while working with fiberglass, fireproofing, sanding drywall, sweeping the floors or handling lead line drywall upon your request. All other requests for a respirator will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. If you have any concerns regarding respiratory hazards, talk with your supervisor. Hand protection. Cleveland Construction supplies several types of gloves to defend against cuts and damage to your hands when handling materials or equipment. Gloves should be worn during cleaning operations, when working with fiberglass, lead line drywall, cutting metal studs, and as directed by your supervisor. When wearing gloves near moving parts, be mindful that they can get caught and pull your hand into danger. If you have any concerns on whether or not you should be using gloves while performing your work, talk to your supervisor. Face Shields A full face shield shall be worn in addition to safety glasses when working in an area with flying or floating debris, such as operating a chop saw, disaster saw, or grinder. In addition, an approved welding hood with a face shield must be worn during all welding operations. When working with spark producing activities, you are required to have a fire extinguisher in your immediate work area. Donning a harness. 
Occasionally, you will be required to wear a full body harness as part of the fall protection system. It is important to wear this equipment properly as improper use can result in serious physical harm. Before donning your harness, be sure to inspect for nicks, cuts, tears, frays, and any deformation of the metal components. If you suspect your harness of being deficient in any way, bring it to the attention of your supervisor. Remember to follow these steps when donning a harness. Step 1. Hold the harness by the D-ring. Shake the harness to allow all of the straps to fall in place. Step 2. If the chest, leg, and or waist straps are buckled, release the straps and unbuckle them at this time. Step 3. Slip the harness over your shoulders so the D-ring is located in the middle of your back between your shoulder blades. Step 4. Pull the leg strap between your legs and connect it to the opposite end. Repeat with the second leg strap. Step 5. Connect the chest strap and position it in the mid-chest area. Tighten it to keep your legs and shoulder straps taut. Step 6. After all straps have been connected, tighten all buckles so that your harness fits snug but allows for full range of movement. Finally, pass the excess strap through the loop keepers. Additional safety equipment used for fall protection, such as lanyards, lifelines, and others, will be reviewed in Lesson 3, Fall Protection. It's very important to thoroughly inspect all personal protection equipment daily, use it properly, and always wear your equipment when it is required. Let's do a quick review of this lesson. Remember that potentially dangerous situations exist on every job site and personal protective equipment is developed to protect you from serious workplace injuries. Cleveland Construction requires that hard hats and safety glasses are to be worn at all times on the job site. Under our voluntary respirator use program, we will provide an N95 dust mask for extra protection upon your request. Always remember to inspect your personal protective equipment before using, as it is your last line of defense. Think about the work to be performed to ensure you have the proper equipment to protect yourself. Lesson number two, fall protection. In the construction industry, falls are the leading cause of worker fatalities. Each year, on average, between 150 and 200 workers are killed, and more than 100,000 are injured as a result of falls at construction sites. Consequently, OSHA has identified falls as one of the top four types of fatalities, along with struck by, caught between, and electrocutions. These four injuries are known as the Focus Four, Cleveland Construction Incorporated has joined OSHA to inform you about these hazards, the methods used to isolate these conditions, and supply the equipment necessary to protect you. Upon completion of this training section, you should understand the hazards of falling, various fall protection systems used on the construction site, the personal equipment available to employees to protect them from falls. Trigger Height for Fall Protection OSHA has established that construction workers who are on a working or walking surface and are exposed to a potential fall of six feet or more must be protected with the use of guardrails, safety net systems, or a personal fall arrest system. When working on a scaffold, those same protections are required when the work platform is more than 10 feet above a lower level. Safety net systems are seldom used in commercial construction and most often used for bridge work. For this reason, we will focus our discussion on the guardrail and personal fall arrest systems. Guardrails. The most common form of fall protection used around the perimeter of a structure and around large floor openings are guardrails. They are commonly constructed according to rigid specifications and made of 2x4 wood construction or steel cabling. Guardrails are usually made from the same steel used for the scaffolding frame. Occasionally, wood 2x4s or chain material may be used on scaffolding. Regardless of the materials used, 
all guardrails must be constructed to meet the rigid specifications to offer the same degree of protection. Although it is not necessary for you to know the exact specification of the installation of guardrails or scaffolding, you must know if the guardrails appear to be adequate. To be adequate, the top rail of the guardrail, or top cable if wire rope is used, is to be set about 42 inches above floor level, or about waist high. If any part of the guardrail or cable sags below 39 inches, employees cannot work until it is repaired. You will occasionally see what appears to be a flimsy guardrail system. They are not guardrails and are not built to the guardrail specifications. They are constructed using rope, wire, or chains strung from stanchion to stanchion and are identified with bright colored flags or ribbons. These areas are being protected with a warning line system or as a controlled access zone. They are set up under special conditions to keep workers away from dangerous areas such as unprotected building edges, floor openings, and brick laying operations to indicate that fall protection is required beyond that point or that only trained, skilled workers are permitted beyond that point. If it is necessary for you to work inside a warning line system, you will be required to be tied off to the structure with a personal fall arrest system, and only workers with the proper training can enter a controlled access zone. Personal Fall Arrest System A personal fall arrest system consists of a full body harness connected to a lanyard with a deceleration device connected to an anchor point. When this equipment is set up properly, it will not permit a free fall of more than six feet because in a fall you increase speed, which places more stress on the equipment and causes a greater jolt to your body. For this reason, it is necessary to attach the equipment so as to take as much slack out of the lanyard as possible by attaching to an anchor point over your head. Let's take a better look at each piece of equipment. Full Body Harness This is a garment made of rugged nylon straps that is worn by the worker that will cradle his body if he should fall. Adequate supplies of these items of personal protective equipment, PPE, are on the job site solely for the protection of our employees. If the equipment is not offered to you and you feel that you are exposed to a fall, ask your supervisor for the equipment before you begin work. We know that you must feel safe and comfortable to produce good work. When you use a harness, make sure that you use all of the adjustable features to snug the harness to your body in case you fall. Lifelines A vertical lifeline is a long rope usually attached to the roof of the structure and hangs down the side of the building so when working on a swing stage you can use a special device called a rope grab to attach their lanyard to the lifeline, completing the fall protection system. A horizontal lifeline is a long rope that has both ends attached to two parts of the structure using a tie-off adapter, allowing usually two workers to attach their lanyard to O-rings on the rope to complete the fall protection system. Lanyards the lanyards are available in either a fixed or a variable length style, sometimes called an adjustable or retractable lanyard. The lanyard is designed so that one end can be attached to the D-ring on the back of the harness, and the other end is attached to the anchor point. The major consideration for selecting the style and length of a lanyard is freedom of movement for the worker and limiting the free fall distance as much as possible. Anchor Points Occasionally, the structure and the personnel lifts will be designed with a build-in anchor point. Otherwise, it is necessary to establish an anchor point with the use of a portable device designed for this purpose. An anchor point must be capable of supporting 5,000 pounds, so the equipment used must be designated for that capacity. There are several portable anchor items that are manufactured to meet the specifications. Tie-off adapters are woven nylon belts designed to be wrapped around substantial parts of the structure. Beam clamps attach to the bottom flange of an I-beam. Concrete anchors are drilled into set concrete and roof anchors can be installed into almost any roof. Falls on the same level. Trips, slips, and falls from walking and working surfaces account for 15% of all accidental deaths in the construction industry. 
These simple housekeeping steps will prevent such accidents. Keep all walking and working areas clean, dry, and free of clutter and debris. Keep materials and supplies neatly stacked. Holes must be covered with a material capable of supporting at least twice the weight of employees, equipment, and materials that may be imposed on the cover at any one time. All covers shall be color-coded or marked hole or cover and fastened to prevent displacement. Special attention must be paid to housekeeping and keeping working areas clear when any work is performed on stilts. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations on the safe working height for the stilts used. Impalement Hazard When working above protruding reinforced steel, additional protection against impalement will often involve the use of steel reinforced covers or wooden troughs. Falling Objects to protect yourself from falling objects, Cleveland Construction requires you to wear your hard hat at all times. There are additional measures that need to be in place to ensure that objects do not fall onto people working or walking below during construction. The following are controls to prevent or minimize the risk of falling objects. Mesh, tow boards, and screens provide falling object protection to people below. Canopies can be used between the falling object hazard and employees and must be strong enough to withstand the impact forces of the potential falling objects. Barricaded areas are sometimes established to keep workers out of areas where objects or materials may fall. Let's do a quick review of this lesson. Falls are the top cause of fatalities on construction job sites. Always wear and use the proper fall arrest equipment. Respect warning lines and controlled access zones. Cover and secure floor openings and maintain a neatly organized work area to prevent slips and trips. It is ultimately your responsibility to pay close attention to what is happening around you at all times. Lesson number three, elevated work platforms. In many situations, Employees are required to perform tasks on elevated levels. Elevated work platforms pose fall hazards. There are many different styles and safety operations of lifts designed for various locations and conditions. Knowing the safe operation for elevated work platforms will eliminate injuries and save your life and others. When you complete this training section, you will be familiar with some of the most common types of elevated work platforms you will encounter on the job site. Understand the safe operation and use of various elevated work platforms. Be able to identify which elevated work platform is most appropriate for the task. And understand which elevated work platform operations require additional training. Cleveland Construction uses several types of elevated work platforms to raise workers up to higher work areas. The most common elevated work platforms are ladders, scaffolds, personnel lifts, and stilts. Ladders. There are two basic types of ladders you will encounter in your work, the extension or straight ladder and the step ladder. Take the time to analyze what type and size ladder is best suited for you to safely perform your work. Extension and straight ladders should extend three feet above the upper surface you intend to access. The base of the ladder should be positioned at a distance from the wall equal to one quarter of the height at which the ladder touches the wall. Tying the top of the ladder to the structure before the first use will prevent side-to-side -side shifts or falling backwards. Always keep the area around the top and bottom of the ladder clear of obstructions. Step ladders must be fully opened and secured. Leaning them against a wall or structure is strictly prohibited. Never stand on or use the top platform or the step below the platform to perform work. If more height is needed, use a taller ladder. While moving up and down ladders, always face the ladder and maintain three points of contact, keeping two hands and one foot or two feet and one hand on the ladder at all times. Do not reach out too far when working on a ladder. A good rule of thumb is to remember to keep your belt buckle within the side rails of the ladder 
while performing any task to maintain proper balance. Inspect all ladders before using, follow warning labels, and report any damaged ladders to your supervisor prior to placing in service. Refrain from carrying tools and other materials while walking up and down the ladder. Utilize a hoisting system to move tools to working areas. Scaffolds All workers must be trained before they use scaffolds. Workers involved in scaffold building must receive additional training from a competent person before the scaffold building begins. When a scaffold work platform is more than 10 feet above a lower level, all workers must be protected from falls with a guardrail or safety net system or personal fall protection equipment. When scaffold platforms are more than two feet above or below a point of access, a ladder, ramp walkway, or stair tower must be used to access the platform. All working levels of a scaffold platform must be fully planked between the ends of the uprights. When work platforms are less than 18 inches wide, fall protection must be used to protect all employees regardless of height. When working with a mobile scaffold, you must lock the wheels or casters at all times before climbing up to the work platform. When the scaffold is set up within 14 inches of a wall, outriggers on the wall side of the scaffold need to be removed and all wheel locks must be locked. All four outriggers must be installed if the scaffold is being used more than 14 inches from the wall. Scaffolds must be kept free from debris, ice, and any other substance that may make the surface slippery. The interior multi-purpose scaffold can be 6 feet, 8 feet, or 10 feet long, but because it is only 29 inches or 30 inches wide, it can be dangerous unless it is built and used according to the manufacturer's instructions. When setting these scaffolds in a stairway, you must remove the casters or wheels and replace them with base plates. Before stacking sections of these narrow scaffolds, the outriggers must be installed at all four corners to prevent tipping. Because these scaffolds are so narrow and workers forget and back off the platform, Cleveland Construction's company policy is to install a guardrail on open sides at any level when it will not interfere with the operation of the scaffold or create an unsafe condition. Inspect all equipment before using. Remove from service all defective or damaged parts. Consult the competent person for scaffolding before altering or modifying any scaffold. Personnel lifts. Often the most efficient means to performing work at elevated levels is the use of a personnel lift, the boom or basket lift, or the scissor lift. This equipment is more efficient and safer than ladders, scaffolding, and a swing stage when used properly. Never operate equipment until you have been trained and you completely understand the functions. Read the safety manual that is in the plastic box or tube located on the equipment before operating this equipment. If the manual is missing, immediately inform your supervisor. Inspect the lift at the beginning of each shift and notify your supervisor about any needed repair, problems, or malfunctions of the equipment. Inspect the work area before and during use with special attention to drop-offs, holes, bumps, obstructions and debris, and any overhead obstructions and electrical wires. The main safety precautions that are mandatory before use of personnel lifts each day are locating the overhead clearance and nearby energized power lines. The following should also be checked before each and every operation of a personnel lift. Outriggers, stabilizers, or extendable axles deployed if equipped. Guardrails in place and gates or chains closed. Load limits and distribution of load on the lift. All safety gear required for the work. Slopes and grades of work area do not exceed manufacturer's rating. Ropes, cords, hoses, or material is not entangled in the platform mechanism. Work area is clear of personnel and equipment. Fuel and charge batteries in a well-ventilated area, free of flame, sparks, and other hazards. Do not fuel the equipment with the engine running. Here are a few additional safety regulations to remember while working on lifts. OSHA has identified not climbing on guardrails as one of the most important aspects of lift safety. 
The deaths due to climbing the rails have increased drastically in the past few years. Additional regulations are Do not attempt stunt driving or horseplay with the equipment. Do not move the lift before checking the travel route. Do not leave the lift unattended without protecting it against unauthorized use. Do not use a personal lift as a crane. Keep your feet on the floor of the lift basket. The one very basic difference in the scissor lift and the boom lift is the fall protection requirements. When using a scissor lift, the guardrail system is the only fall protection needed as long as you keep both feet on the floor of the lift. In the boom lift, due to a much greater potential for ejection, you must be fitted with a harness and lanyard and you must be tied off to the anchor point on the lift platform at all times. While operating boom or scissor lifts, you are not permitted to remove one foot from the floor of the lift or stand on the guardrails. To exit a lift at various heights, you must use a scissor lift, not a boom or basket lift. Position the lift so that the gate of the lift is aligned with the structure to permit a level and an unobstructed transition from lift to the structure. You must have two lanyards attached to your harness for the following procedure. With one lanyard attached to the lift, you must attach the second lanyard to the structure. A substantial structure must be able to hold 5,000 pounds. In this case, ductwork, pipes, and conduit cannot be used. And immediately detach the lanyard attached to the lift. The reverse process is to be used to get back into the lift. If the requirements of this system are not clear to you, or if you encounter any difficulty using this equipment, notify your supervisor immediately. Stilts. When working on stilts, the most important thing to remember is to keep all work areas clear of materials, cords, and anything that could pose a trip hazard. You must read the manufacturer's recommendations for the use of this equipment to become familiar with its limitations. Special Considerations Before using an elevated platform, you must inspect the work area for electrical power lines to see if they are within 10 feet of your work area. If your work is within 10 feet of a power line, you must have your supervisor make sure that the power to those lines has been shut off or that the power lines have been isolated by a competent person to prevent contact. Another safety issue that arises during the use of elevated work platforms is falling objects. The main focus while working on elevated work platforms is to prevent tools, materials, and equipment from falling from the platforms. Tow boards, paneling, and screening align the platform and help prevent falling objects. When all objects cannot be contained on the platform, the area must be barricaded below and or canopies must be used for the protection of people walking or working below. Let's do a quick review of this lesson. Some of the elevated work platforms you will encounter include ladders, scaffolds, personnel lifts, and stilts. It is important to choose the most appropriate and safest elevated work platform depending on the work to be completed. When working on ladders, be sure to use the proper length, height ladder and maintain three points of contact. Extension ladders should extend three feet above the working surface and be secured at the top. When working on scaffolding above 10 feet, fall protection is required. Only individuals trained to build scaffolding can erect scaffolding on the job site. When working in personnel lifts, pay attention to overhead obstructions as to not get any part of your body caught between the lift and the obstruction. Never stand on or climb guardrails. When working in a boom type lift, you must be tied off to an anchor point in the lift at all times. If you are unable to follow the established safety rules in order to perform your work, you must talk with your supervisor and or the safety department to determine how the work will be accomplished. Lesson number four, material handling and storage. There are right and wrong ways to prepare, lift, and transport materials on a construction job site, and it is your responsibility to follow the best work practices. Even with the increased use of machinery and equipment, most materials are moved by hand during some phase of construction. Back, knee, and foot-related injuries frequently occur if you don't use caution. The improper handling and storage of materials 
often result in costly and incapacitating injuries. Whether moving materials manually or mechanically, you must know and understand the potential hazards associated with the task at hand and how to control your workplaces to minimize the danger. Because numerous injuries can result from improperly handling and storing materials, you should be aware of proper work practices. When you complete this training section, you will understand how to identify the most common material handling hazards and the methods for eliminating or at least minimizing the occurrence of material handling accidents. Manual Materials Handling Preparation on the job site can save you and your body from aches and pains. A five-minute stretch or warm-up is recommended each day to prevent injuries. One of the most overlooked areas of material handling is protruding nails. Prior to lifting, pull all protruding nails off of your load or bend them flush. Clean up jagged, sharp metal edges and wear gloves whenever cuts, splinters, blisters, or other injuries are possible. Set materials, tools, and other objects on pallets for easy lifting. When lifting objects and tools, be sure to know the weight of what you are lifting and utilize help with heavy or awkward loads. Remember to work smart and not beyond your actual physical ability. Keeping the lift load close to your body, your back straight, and lifting up with your legs will save you from sprains and muscle pulls. When making sudden turns, changing the position of your feet will prevent back twists and other injuries. If you can't handle the material comfortably alone, get help and let the person know when you will let go of the load. Material Storage All materials and tools used on the job site should be stored properly when not in use to avoid accidents, injuries, wasted materials, and project delays. Neat and proper storage can prevent accidental falls, falling objects, and injuries. When storing materials, there are six basic rules to ensure proper storage and good housekeeping. Number one, keep total weight within the safe loading limits of the building's floor. Number two, keep passageways clear. Number three, Control materials so that they do not slide, fall, roll, or collapse. Number four, provide cribbing for heavy loads on unstable surfaces. Number five, store materials away from traffic. Number six, place stored materials at least six feet away from floor openings and at least 10 feet away from a building edge if walls do not extend above the top of the material. Mechanical Material Handling Similar to the manual material handling, mechanical material handling requires the same extensive preparation and regulations. Knowing the weight and capacity of the handling device can also prevent accidents and injuries. The capacities of cranes, forklifts, chain fall, come along, and other mechanical material are all different. Knowledge of these different capacities can save you and other workers. Mobile and Heavy Equipment Special training or certification is required to operate heavy equipment such as front end loaders, forklifts, cranes, or trucks. Struck by accidents are one of OSHA's top four causes of fatalities. It is the responsibility of all ground personnel to be aware of certain safety measures while working around heavy equipment. Ground personnel should stay in the operator's vision at all times and out of blind spots. Never position yourself directly behind a piece of equipment, as the operator will not be able to see you. Wearing your required high visibility vest and establishing eye contact before entering a machine's area of operation will ensure you're recognized by the operator. You must wear your seatbelt at all times while operating material handling equipment. Operating machinery should have an audible backup alarm. Any equipment with defective alarms should be pulled from service and repaired. Let's do a quick review of this lesson. It is important to remember to get extra help when an object is too heavy or bulky to lift or move by yourself comfortably. When lifting heavy material, bend at your knees and keep your back straight. The proper material storage keeps passageways clear and materials away from heavy traffic areas. It is important to understand the capacities of any material handling equipment you use you have a responsibility to operate in a safe manner while working around heavy equipment. 
Make sure to examine your workplaces to detect any unsafe or unhealthful conditions, practices, or equipment and take corrective action for you and your coworkers' safety. Clear your way. Examine the entire route you will be using to move the material from one location to another before you begin. Clear debris and obstructions that may hinder your passage. Select a route that offers fewer challenges, steps, ramps, and sharp turns. Accidents result from unexpected events. Planning reduces the unexpected. Lesson number five, power tools and electrical. Power tools help us to easily perform tasks that otherwise would be difficult or impossible. However, these simple tools can be hazardous and have the potential for causing severe injuries when used or maintained improperly. Special attention toward power tool safety is necessary in order to reduce or eliminate these hazards. Be sure to follow the manufacturer's recommendation and instructions for product use at all times. If you are not familiar with the proper use of a tool or equipment, talk with your supervisor. Never use equipment when it is marked out of service. To ensure the safety of others, if you come across a defective tool not labeled, please label it and describe what is defective, then turn in the defective equipment to your supervisor for repair. When you complete this section, you will understand the proper use, safety, and maintenance of powder-actuated tools, good safety practices related to electrical power, and the safe operation of lasers. Powder-actuated tools. The use of powder-actuated tools will be restricted to you until you have been properly trained for the safe use of the specific tool you'll be working with. These tools offer the same hazards and safety considerations of a firearm. If you have not been trained or feel unfamiliar, you should not use this equipment and inform your supervisor. Employees using powder-actuated tools must wear safety glasses with side shields and earplugs at all times. Inspect each tool every day prior to loading it for use to determine that all parts and safety devices are in proper working conditions. Only use manufacturer fasteners and powder loads and make sure you understand the manufacturer's instructions. When operating, always hold the tool perpendicular to and firmly against the intended work surface. Always make a test fastening with the lowest power level load recommended for the tool. Powder load identification is identified by color and using the wrong load can be very hazardous. The following safety precautions must be followed when using powder actuated tools. Do not load the tool until ready for use. Never load a fastener with your finger on the trigger. Do not point the tool, loaded or empty, at anyone. Do not use the tool in an explosive or flammable atmosphere. Do not drive fasteners into any chipped area or very hard or brittle materials. Do not drive fasteners into easily penetrated or thin materials unless backed by a material that will prevent the fastener from passing completely through the other side. And do not leave loaded powder actuated tools unattended. Pick up and properly dispose of all cartridges. Non-discharged cartridges are to be disposed in water. Always store the tool unloaded so that untrained workers cannot accidentally discharge the tool. If you are operating a powder actuated tool, always warn others in the area and pay attention to warning signs around you. Be sure to read the tools manual for proper use, safety, and maintenance. Power Tools Employees using power tools must wear safety glasses with side shields at all times and other personal protective equipment as may be appropriate. Tools are to be inspected before use each day. If the tools are defective, mark the tool as out of service and give to your supervisor. To prevent hazards associated with the use of power tools, workers should observe the following general precautions. Never carry a tool by the cord or hose. Never pull the cord or the hose to disconnect it from the receptacle. Keep cords and hoses away from heat, oil, and sharp edges. Disconnect tools when you are not using them before servicing and cleaning them, and when changing accessories, such as blades, bits, and cutters. Keep all people not involved with the work at a safe distance from the work area. 
secure material with clamps or a vise, freeing both hands to operate the tool. Avoid accidental starting. Do not hold fingers on the switch button while carrying a plugged-in tool. Maintain tools with care. Keep them sharp and clean for best performance. And follow instructions in the user's manual for lubricating and changing accessories. The exposed moving parts of all power tools need to be safeguarded. Safety guards must never be removed when a tool is being used. Portable circular saws having a blade greater than 2 inches in diameter must be equipped at all times with guards. Ensure that all guards are installed and working properly. Power Considerations OSHA has identified electrocution as one of the top four causes of construction fatalities. All receptacle outlets on construction sites used to supply power to electrical equipment via an extension cord must have a ground fault circuit interrupter. Cleveland Construction requires you to inspect extension cords daily before starting work. Check for breaks and in insulation, missing grounding plug, insulation pulled out of the plug, and other damage. If you find damages, do not use the extension cord until it is repaired and approved by your supervisor. Your project superintendent shall ensure that all equipment is properly tagged out of service and removed. Portable GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter, shall be used between a power tool and any electrical outlet when an extension cord is used. The GFCI is to be tested at the beginning of each work shift by using the test and reset buttons on the GFCI. When using extension cords on the job site, extreme caution must be exercised. Flexible cords must be used only in continuous lengths without splice, except for molded or vulcanized splices. Extension cords passing through working areas shall be covered or elevated to protect the cord from damage. All cords are to be positioned safely on the ground, which will prevent damage and trip hazards. Also, extension cords shall not be fastened with staples, hung from nails, run over by sharp edges, or suspended by wires, which may cause damage. Prevention of Electrocutions Extreme caution must be exercised when working around high voltage lines. When you walk on a job site, look for overhead power lines and identify existing utilities before starting work. Maintain a safe distance at least 10 feet away from energized power lines when operating any equipment to avoid possible electrocutions. Never operate portable electric tools unless they are grounded or are of the approved double insulated type, which are marked double insulated on the tool housing. Lasers. When operating a laser with an output of less than 5 milliwatts, you must be familiar with the following safety considerations. Post at least one laser warning sign at each laser location. Turn the laser off when it's not required or is left unattended for a substantial period of time. Do not look directly into the laser or point at another person. Set the laser up well above the heads of employees when possible. Otherwise, set it up well below. Let's do a quick review of this lesson. Always follow all manufacturer's recommendations for the proper use of power and powder actuated tools. When using powder actuated tools, never leave a tool unattended and if the tool leaves your hand, ensure it is unloaded. Signs will be posted to let you know a powder actuated tool is in use and you should pay attention to where it is being used in relation to where you are working. Never remove a safety guard from any tool even just for one operation. If a tool is damaged or not working correctly, it should be marked out of service and turned in to a supervisor. Always inspect extension cords, power tools, and ensure GFCIs are in place and working correctly to protect yourself from possible electrical hazards. Watch for signs indicating a laser is being operated, and remember not to look directly into the laser. Lesson number six, HASCOM program. Many products used on construction sites are composed of chemicals or compounds that are hazardous to your health and physical well-being. You have the right to know about compounds or elements in building materials that may threaten your health. 
Cleveland Construction has developed a program to protect and teach you how to identify the hazards and handle them in a safe manner. This section is commonly called a Hazardous Communication Program, or HAZCOM program. Our program will inform you about each hazardous item on the job site, the dangers associated with these materials, how they affect your health, how to protect yourself against harmful effects, and how to treat yourself or others should someone become exposed to harmful materials. Objectives When you complete this training section, you will understand the details of your Right to Know Hazardous Communication program developed by the employer including OSHA's Hazard Communication Standard Revision to align with the United Nations Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals, GHS, and published in the Federal Register, March 2012. The location of the SDS binder and its contents. And how to take appropriate action if hazardous exposure occurs. Manufacturers of construction products are required to identify the hazardous elements in their products so you can handle them when necessary. Two methods are used to communicate the hazardous elements to everyone on the job site. Informative warning labels are placed on the container and a published analytical report for each product, called a safety data sheet, or simply called SDS, are available on the job site. The person giving you this training video will show you where the SDS binder is located on your job site. Every product brought to a construction site must be labeled for identification. The label must describe the hazards associated with the product, how to protect yourself against those hazards, and a course of action to be taken when exposed to the harmful ingredients. Labels on containers are required by OSHA's Global Harmonization System are required to have harmonized signal words, pictograms, and hazard statements for each hazard, class, and category. OSHA designated nine pictograms under the GHS to convey the health, physical, and environmental hazards of each substance. After June 1, 2015, all substance labels must follow OSHA Revised Hazard Communication Plan Global Harmonization System. In addition to the labels, the manufacturer is required to create a document that thoroughly analyzes every element in the product, how harmful the elements can affect your health, what is needed to protect yourself, and what to do when a person is exposed to the product. The Safety Data Sheet, or SDS, will be readily available for workers using harmful products. The SDS for products on a construction site can be found in the on-site offices of the general contractor and the contractor who brought the item to the job site. Inside the SDS, you will find details on all the hazardous chemicals on the job site. SDS sheets will vary slightly in appearance, but always contains 16 sections. Section 1 includes the product identification. Section 2 includes hazards identification. Section 3 identifies the composition and information on ingredients. Section 4 includes the recommended first aid measures. Section 5 includes firefighting measures. Section 6 includes accidental release measures. Section 7 identifies the proper handling and storage. Section 8 includes the exposure control and personal protection. Section 9 includes physical and chemical properties. Section 10 identifies stability and reactivity. Section 11, toxicological information. Section 12, ecological information. Section 13, disposal consideration. Section 14, transport information. Section 15, regulatory information. Section 16 is other information including state of preparation or last revision. Sections 12 to 16 may be included in the SDS, but they are not required by OSHA. Sections 1 and 2 will identify the substance and hazards associated with the product. Composition and information on ingredients is contained in Section 3. Sections 4 through 6 cover first aid, firefighting, and accidental release measures. Sections 7 and 8 identify the proper handling and storage of chemicals and include exposure and control measures of chemicals. The information on the SDS will remain essentially the same as required in the previous Hazard Communication Standard for Material Safety Data Sheets, 
also known as MSDS. The previous hazard communication standard dictated the content of the SDS, but did not specify its format. The GHS revisions require that information be in a specified sequence. The SDS is always available for your review if you should have any questions regarding your protection, treatment, or any other concern. Remember to pay attention to the materials that you encounter for strange odors and unusual reactions to your skin or your mouth, nasal, or respiratory irritation, the feeling of lightheaded or dizziness, headaches, stomach aches, and loss of consciousness. Hazards can cause many side effects and even produce unconsciousness or death if exposure occurs. If you are exposed to the harmful effects of any product on a construction site, you should contact your supervisor immediately and request a copy of the SDS. Let's do a quick review of this lesson. You can prevent and respond to exposure from hazardous materials by reading labels, knowing the proper handling, cleanup, and disposing of various materials. You should also wear the proper personal protective equipment. Evacuate and ventilate any affected areas to reduce hazardous levels of the contaminant. Immediately report the incident to your supervisor. Determining proper treatment including first aid and professional medical assistance can be found from the product labels or the safety data sheets, SDS, located in the job site trailer. Read the labels so you know what you are handling. Share this information with coworkers and other subcontractors in the affected work area. It's not just your right to know, it's your responsibility to know. Lesson number seven, fire protection. As construction progresses, fire hazard conditions constantly change. Practice fire prevention at work by keeping work areas clear of combustibles, controlling possible sources of ignition, and understanding the proper use of fire suppression equipment. Fire extinguishers are provided for each 3,000 square feet of building area and within 100 feet of any given point in the protected area. It is important to remember that you should never attempt to put out a fire if it puts you or your coworkers in a situation of danger or if you're not familiar with the fire extinguisher available on site. Smoking is prohibited at or near the vicinity of operations, which could easily create a fire hazard. When you complete this training section, you will understand the different classifications of fire extinguishers, how to use a fire extinguisher, evacuation procedures, and hot works permits. Fire causes. On construction sites, the potential for small fires are often caused by welding, cutting, grinding, and using flammable materials in portable heaters. Special attention must be given to prevent fires when performing these construction activities. Flammables or combustibles. Refueling of portable power equipment, such as generators and other construction equipment, should not be done while the equipment is running or hot. Refueling should also be in well-ventilated areas, away from flames and other sources of ignition. Safety cans and cabinets must meet OSHA and UL listed standards for use with flammable and combustible liquids. The following steps should be followed when responding to the early stages of a fire. Sound the fire alarm and call 911 if appropriate. Identify a safe evacuation path before approaching the fire. Do not allow the fire heat, or smoke to come between you and your evacuation path. Select the appropriate type of fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher classifications. All fire extinguishers are labeled under specific classifications of the type of fires for which they can be used. ABC fire extinguishers will be provided on all construction sites and can be used on all types of fires. This chart shows what extinguishers to use on various types of fires. Class A fire extinguishers are used for combustibles such as wood, cloth, and paper. Class B fire extinguishers are used for flammable liquids such as gasoline, oil, and oil-based paints. Class C fire extinguishers are used for energized electrical equipment including wiring, fuse boxes, circuit breakers, machinery, and appliances. Class D fire extinguishers are used for combustible material such as magnesium or sodium. 
be sure to use the appropriate fire extinguisher while putting out the different classifications of fires. Use the pass technique when discharging a fire extinguisher within its effective range. How to use fire extinguisher after identification. A fire extinguisher can only be used for small fires. When it comes to using a fire extinguisher, remember the acronym PASS, which stands for Pull, Aim, Squeeze, Sweep. Pull. The first step is to pull the pin that prevents the handle from being squeezed. Aim. The second step is to aim the spray nozzle, or if attached, the hose nozzle, at the fire. Aim low at the base of the fire. Squeeze. The third step is to squeeze the handle to spray the contents. Remember, a standard fire extinguisher has less than 30 seconds of spray time. Sweep. The final step is to sweep back and forth as you spray the base of the fire. Replace all fire extinguishers that have been discharged and give them to your supervisor. Evacuate immediately if the extinguisher is empty and the fire is not out or if the fire progresses beyond its early stage. If you have the slightest doubt about your ability to fight a fire, evacuate immediately. Hot Works Permit Requirement Hot Works Permits are required by some employers to control welding, burning, cutting, and other spark-producing activities. It is your responsibility to find out if you need a permit for your work operations if they produce sparks. When working with spark-producing activities, you are required to have a fire extinguisher in your immediate work area. It is also important to leave the building when the alarm sounds and head to the designated safe area identified by the superintendent. Let's do a quick review of this chapter. Remember, if there is a fire, sound the alarm and call for professional firefighters and go to the designated safe area. If you're using a fire extinguisher, remember the pass technique to put out small fires. While fires can cause damage to the structure and construction schedules, the greatest loss is personal injury or death. Cleveland Construction views safety as the most important aspect of your job. Our goal is to make sure that you go home to your family and friends after every workday. This video is designed to cover the basic safety rules and the aspects that will affect you as you perform your job. It is also important to review the written safety rules that are found in the safety handbook and ask your supervisor if you have any questions about how to perform your work safely. Some of the equipment covered in this video, such as forklifts, cranes, powder actuated tools, and others may require an additional hands-on training or verification before you will be allowed to work with those pieces of equipment. If you are asked to perform a task or duty that you're not familiar with, it is your responsibility to tell your supervisor you need additional training. While working on job sites, you must ask questions anytime you are unsure about how to perform your work safely. It is also your responsibility as part of our team safety program to not only follow all safety rules yourself, but to also remind your coworkers to follow all safety rules as well. It is everyone's job to make our construction job sites as safe as possible.